Hi, I'm Glenda Cedarleaf, and I'm going to read you a story called Emily of New Moon by L. M. Montgomery. This is part one. So I invite you first to become comfortable in the ways that you know best, settling into your bed, feeling your body supported by the bed, aware of the softness of your sheets and blankets and pillow, and knowing that right now there's no place you have to go, nothing that you have to do. This is your time to settle into this story and relax as you gently fall asleep. So let's begin. The house in the hollow was a mile from anywhere. It was situated in a grassy little dale, looking as if it had never been built like other houses, but had grown up there like a big brown mushroom. It was reached by a long green lane and almost hidden from view by an encircling growth of young birches. No other house could be seen from it, although the village was just over the hill. Ellen Green said it was the lonesomest place in the world. This is the house where Emily lived, and Ellen worked there as a caregiver. Emily would say that she did not know what lonesomeness meant. She had plenty of company, There was Father, and Mike, and Saucy Sal. The Wind Woman was also around. And there were the trees, Adam and Eve, the Rooster Pine, and all the friendly Lady Birches. And there was the Flash, too. She never knew when it might come and the possibility of it kept her a thrill and expectant. It had been a dull, cold day in early May, threatening to rain, but never raining. Father had lain on the sitting room lounge all day. He had coughed a good deal, and he had not talked much to Emily, which was a very unusual thing for him. Most of the time he lay with his hands clasped under his head and his large sunken dark blue eyes fixed dreamily and unseeingly on the cloudy sky that was visible between the boughs of the two big spruces in the front yard. Emily wondered what father was thinking of, but she never bothered him with questions when his cough was bad. She only wished she had somebody to talk to. She curled herself up in the ragged, comfortable old wing chair and read a book. When Ellen announced that supper was ready, Douglas Starr, her father, told Emily to go out and have dinner. I don't want anything tonight. I'll just lie here and rest. And when you come in again, we'll have a real talk, Elfkin. He smiled up at her, his old beautiful smile with the love behind it that Emily always found so sweet. She ate her supper quite happily, though it wasn't a good supper. The bread was soggy and her egg was underdone. But for a wonder, she was allowed to have both Saucy Sal and Mike sitting one on each side of her. Mike was her favorite. He was a handsome dark gray cat with huge owl-like eyes. And he was so soft and fat and fluffy. 
Sal was always thin, and no amount of feeding put any flesh on her bones. She was gray and white, very white and very sleek, with a long pointed face, very long ears, and very green eyes. After supper, Emily went in and found that her father had fallen asleep. She was very glad of this because she knew he had not slept much for the two nights before. But she was a little disappointed that they were not going to have that real talk. Real talks with father were always such delightful things. But the next best would be a walk a lovely all-by-your-lonesome walk through the gray evening of the young spring. It was so long since she had a walk. She put the faded blue hood on over her long, heavy braid of glossy jet black hair and smiled chummily at her reflection in the little greenish glass. The smile began at the corner of her lips and spread over her face in a long, slow, subtle, wonderful way. As Douglas Starr often thought, it was her dead mother's smile, the thing that had caught and held him long ago when he had first seen Juliet Murray. It seemed to be Emily's only physical inheritance from her mother. In all else, he thought, she was like the stars, in her large purplish-gray eyes with their very long lashes and black brows, in her high white forehead, too high for beauty, in the delicate modeling of her pale oval face and sensitive mouth, in the little ears that were pointed just a wee bit to show that she was kin to tribes of Elfin. I'm going for a walk with the wind woman, dear, said Emily. The wind woman is going to be out in the fields tonight. She is tall and misty, with thin, gray, silky clothes blowing all about her, and wings like a bat's. Only you can see through them and shining eyes like stars looking through her long, loose hair. She can fly. But tonight she will walk with me all over the fields. She's a great friend of mine, the wind woman is. I've known her ever since I was six. We're old, old friends, but not quite so old as you and I. Little Emily in the glass. We've been friends always, haven't we? With a blown kiss to little Emily in the glass, Emily out of the glass was off. The wind woman was waiting for her outside, ruffling the little spears of striped grass that were sticking up stiffly in the bed under the sitting room window tossing the big boughs of Adam and Eve, whispering among the misty green branches of the birches, teasing the rooster pine behind the house. It really did look like an enormous, ridiculous rooster with a huge, bunchy tail and a head thrown back to crow. It was so long since Emily had been out for a walk that she was half crazy with the joy of it. The winter had been so stormy and the snow so deep that she was never allowed out. April had been a month of rain and wind, so on this May evening she felt like a released prisoner. Where should she go? Down to the brook or over the fields to the spruce barrens? Emily chose the latter. She loved the spruce barrens, away at the further end of the long, sloping pasture. That was a place where magic was made. 
She came more fully into her fairy birthright there than in any other place. Nobody who saw Emily skimming over the bare field would have envied her. She was little and pale and poorly clad. Sometimes she shivered in her thin jacket. Yet a queen might have gladly given a crown for her visions, her dreams of wonder. The brown frosted grasses under her feet were velvet piles. The old mossy gnarled half-dead spruce tree under which she paused for a moment to look up into the sky was a marble column and a palace of the gods. The far dusky hills were the ramparts of a city of wonder. And for companions, she had all the fairies of the countryside, for she could believe in them here, the fairies of the white clover and satin catkins, the little green folk of the grass, the elves of the young fir trees, sprites of wind and wild fern and thistledown. Anything might happen there. Everything might come true. And the barrens were such a splendid place in which to play hide-and-seek with the wind woman. She was so very real there. If you could just spring quickly enough around a little cluster of spruces, only you never could, you could see her as well as feel her and hear her. There she was. That was the sweep of her gray cloak. No, she was laughing up in the very top of the taller trees. And the chase was on again, till all at once it seemed as if the wind woman were gone, and the evening was bathed in a wonderful silence. And there was a sudden rift in the curdled clouds westward, and a lovely pale pinky green lake of sky with a new moon in it. Emily stood and looked at it with clasped hands and her little black head upturned. She must go home and write down a description of it in the yellow account book. It would hurt her with its beauty until she wrote it down. Then she would read it to father she must not forget how the tips of the trees on the hill came out like fine black lace across the edge of the pinky green sky. And then for one glorious supreme moment came the flash. Emily called it that, although she felt that the name didn't exactly describe it. It couldn't be described, not even to father who always seemed a little puzzled by it. Emily never spoke of it to anyone else. It had always seemed to Emily ever since she could remember that she was very, very near to a world of wonderful beauty. Between it and herself hung only a thin curtain. She could never draw the curtain aside but sometimes, just for a moment, a wind fluttered it, and then it was as if she caught a glimpse of the enchanting realm beyond. Only a glimpse, and heard a note of unearthly music. This moment came rarely, went swiftly, leaving her breathless with the inexpressible delight of it. She could never recall it, never summon it, never pretend it. But the wonder of it stayed with her for days. It never came twice with the same thing. Tonight, the dark bows against that far-off sky had given it. 
It had come with a high, wild note of wind in the night, with a shadow wave over a ripe field, with a gray bird lighting on her window still in a storm, with the singing of holy, holy, holy in church, with a glimpse of the kitchen fire when she had come home on a dark autumn night. With the spirit-like blue of ice palms on a twilight pane. With a felicitous new word when she was writing down a description of something. And always when the flash came to her, Emily felt that life was a wonderful, mysterious thing of persistent beauty. She scuttled back to the house in the hollow, through the gathering twilight, all agog to get home and write down her description before the memory picture of what she had seen grew a little blurred. She knew just how she would begin it. The hill called to me and something in me called back to it. Back at the house, she found Ellen Green waiting for her on the sunken front doorstep. Emily was so full of happiness that she loved everything at that moment, even things of no importance. She flung her arms around Ellen's knees and hugged them, but Ellen looked down gloomily into the rapt little face where excitement had kindled a faint wild rose flush and said with a ponderous sigh, Do you know that your pa has only a week or two more to live? Emily stood quite still and looked up at Ellen's broad red face, as still as if she had been suddenly turned to stone. She felt as if she had, She was as stunned as if Ellen had struck her a physical blow. The effect was so startling that even Ellen Green felt uncomfortable. Come you in now, out of the damp, and I'll give you a cookie before you go to bed. Emily went upstairs and held her cat Mike tightly in her arms as she sat in the darkness on her little cot bed. Amid her agony and desolation, there was a certain comfort in the feel of his soft fur and round, velvety head. Emily was not crying. She stared straight into the darkness. She did not doubt it. Something told her it was true. If I was God, I wouldn't let things like this happen, she said. The flash will never come again. It can't, she thought. But Emily had inherited certain things from her fine old ancestors. The power to fight to suffer, to pity, to love very deeply, to rejoice, to endure. These things were all in her and looked out at you through her purplish-gray eyes. Her heritage of endurance came to her aid now and bore her up. She must not let her father know what Ellen had told her. It might hurt him. She must keep it all to herself. 
and in the meantime, love Father, oh, so much, in the little while she could yet have him. The voices of the gentle spring night called to her, all unheeded. Unheard, the wind woman whistled by the eaves. For the fairies dwell only in the kingdom of happiness, having no souls they cannot enter, the kingdom of sorrow. She lay there cold and tearless and motionless when her father came into the room. How very slowly he walked. How was it she had never noticed these things before? But he was not coughing at all. What if? A wild hope shot through her aching heart. She gave a little gasp. Douglas Starr came over to her bed. She felt his dear nearness as he sat down on the chair beside her in his old red dressing gown. Oh, how she loved him. There was no other father like him in all the world. There never could have been. So tender, so understanding, so wonderful. They had always been such chums. They had loved each other so much. It couldn't be that they were to be separated. Winkums, are you asleep? No, whispered Emily. Are you sleepy, small dear? No, not sleepy. Douglas Starr took her hand and held it tightly. Then we'll have our talk, honey. I can't sleep either. I want to tell you something. I know it, burst out Emily. Oh, Father, I know it. Ellen told me. Douglas Starr was silent for a moment. Then he said under his breath, The old fool. Again, for the last time, Emily hoped. Perhaps it was all dreadful mistake. It isn't true, is it, Father? She whispered. Emily, child, said her father, I can't lift you up. I haven't the strength, but climb up and sit on my knee in the old way. Emily slipped out of bed and got on her father's knee. He wrapped the old dressing gown about her and held her close with his face against hers. Dear little child, little beloved Emily Ken, it is quite true, he said. I meant to tell you myself tonight, and now that old absurdity of an Ellen has told you and hurt you dreadfully, Emily fought something down that wanted to choke her. Father, I can't. I can't bear it. Yes, you can and will. You will live because there is something for you to do, I think. You have my gift, along with something I never had. You will succeed where I failed, Emily. I haven't been able to do much for you, sweetheart, but I've done what I could. I've taught you something, I think, in spite of Ellen Green. Emily, do you remember your mother? Just a little here and there, like lovely bits of dreams. You were only four when she died. I've never talked much to you about her, I couldn't. But I'm going to tell you all about her tonight. It doesn't hurt me to talk of her now. I'll see her soon again. You don't look like her, Emily, only when you smile. For the rest, you're like your namesake, my mother. When you were born, I wanted to call you Juliet, too. But your mother wouldn't. She said, if we called you Juliet, then I'd soon take to calling her mother to distinguish between you, and she couldn't endure that. So we called you after my mother, her maiden name was Emily Bird. 
Your mother thought Emily the prettiest name in the world. It was quaint and delightful. Emily, your mother, was the sweetest woman ever made. His voice trembled and Emily snuggled close. I met her 12 years ago when I was sub-editor of the Enterprise up in Charlottetown and she was in her last year at Queen's. She was tall and fair and blue-eyed. She looked a little like your Aunt Laura. Their eyes were very much alike and their voices. She was one of the Murrays from Blair Water. I've never told you much about your mother's people, Emily. They live up on the old North Shore at Blair Water on New Moon Farm. Always have lived there since the first Murray came out of the old country in 1790. The ship he came on was called the New Moon and he named his farm after her. It's a nice name. The new moon is such a pretty thing, said Emily, interested for a moment. There's been a Murray ever since at New Moon Farm. They're a proud family. The Murray pride is a byword along the North Shore. Well, they had some things to be proud of. That cannot be denied, but they carried it too far. Folks call them the chosen people up there. They increased and multiplied and scattered all over, but the old stock at New Moon Farm is pretty well run out. Only your aunts, Elizabeth and Laura, live there now, and their cousin, Jimmy Murray. They never married, could not find anyone good enough for a Murray, so it used to be said. Your Uncle Oliver and your Uncle Wallace live in Summerside, your Aunt Ruth in Shrewsbury, and your great Aunt Nancy at Priest Pond. Priest Pond? That's an interesting name. Not a pretty name like New Moon and Blair Water, but interesting, said Emily. Feeling Father's arm around her, the horror had momentarily shrunk away. For just a little while, she ceased to believe it. Douglas Starr tucked the dressing gown a little more closely around her, kissed her black head, and went on. Elizabeth and Laura and Wallace and Oliver and Ruth were old Archibald Murray's children. His first wife was their mother, and when he was 60, he married again, a young slip of a girl who died when your mother was born. Juliet was 20 years younger than her half-family, as she used to call them. She was very pretty and charming, and they all loved her and were very proud of her. When she fell in love with me, a poor young journalist with nothing in the world but his pen and his ambition, there was a family earthquake. The Murray pride couldn't tolerate the thing at all. I won't rake it all up, but things were said I could never forget or forgive. Your mother married me, Emily, and the new moon people would have nothing more to do with her. Can you believe that? In spite of it, she was never sorry for marrying me. Emily put her hand up and patted her father's hollow cheek. Of course she wouldn't be sorry. Of course she would rather have you than all the Murrays of any kind of a moon. Father laughed a little, and there was just a note of triumph in his laugh. Yes, she seemed to feel that way about it, and we were so happy. Oh, Emily Kin, there were never two happier people in the world. You were the child of that happiness. I remember the night you were born in the little house in Charlottetown. It was in May, and a west wind was blowing silvery clouds over the moon. There was a star or two here and there. In our tiny garden, everything we had was small except our love and our happiness. It was dark and blossomy. 
I walked up and down the path between the beds of violets your mother had planted and prayed. The pale east was just beginning to glow like a rosy pearl when someone came and told me I had a little daughter. I went in and your mother was weak, but she smiled that dear, slow, wonderful smile I loved and said, We've got the only baby of any importance in the world, dear. Just think of that. I wish people could remember from the very moment they're born, said Emily. It would be so very interesting. I dare say we'd have a lot of uncomfortable memories, said her father, laughing a little. It can't be very pleasant getting used to living, no pleasanter than it is getting used to stopping it. But you didn't seem to find it hard. You were a good wee kidlet, Emily. We had four more happy years, and then... Do you remember the time your mother died, Emily? I remember the funeral, Father. I remember it distinctly. You were standing in the middle of a room, holding me in your arms. And you were crying, and I couldn't think why. Yes, I recall that. Your mother died very suddenly. I don't think we'll talk about it. I came out here, and we've had four lovely years together, haven't we, small dear one? Yes. Oh, yes. Those years and what I've taught you in them are the only legacy I can leave you, Emily. From a worldly point of view, I've certainly been a failure. But your mother's people will care for you, I know that. And they can't help loving you. Perhaps I should have sent for them before. Perhaps I ought to do it yet. But I have pride of a kind, too. The stars are not entirely traditionless. We'll stay together to the very end, little Emily child. We won't be parted for a minute. And I want you to be brave. You mustn't be afraid of anything, Emily. Death isn't terrible. The universe is full of love, and spring comes everywhere. And in death, you open and shut a door. There are beautiful things on the other side of the door. I'll find your mother there. I've doubted many things, but I've never doubted that. Sometimes I've been afraid that she would get so far ahead of me in the ways of eternity that I'd never catch up. But I feel now that she's waiting for me and we'll wait for you. We won't hurry, we'll loiter and linger till you catch up with us. I wish you could take me right through the door with you, whispered Emily. After a little while, you won't wish that. You have yet to learn how kind time is. And life has something for you. I feel it. Go forward to meet it fearlessly, dear. I know you don't feel like that just now, but you will remember my words by and by. I feel just now, said Emily, who couldn't bear to hide anything from Father, that I don't like God anymore. Douglas Starr laughed, the laugh Emily liked best. It was such a dear laugh. She caught her breath over the dearness of it. She felt his arms tightening around her. Yes, you do, honey. You can't help liking God. He is love itself, you know. You mustn't mix him up with Ellen Green's God, of course. Emily didn't know exactly what father meant, but all at once she found that she wasn't afraid any longer, and the bitterness had gone out of her sorrow, and the unbearable pain out of her heart. 
She felt as if love was all about her and around her, breathed out from some great invisible hovering tenderness. One couldn't be afraid or bitter where love was, and love was everywhere. Father was going through the door. No, he was going to lift a curtain. She liked that thought better, because a curtain wasn't as hard and fast as a door. And he would slip into that world of which the flash had given her glimpses. He would be there in its beauty, never very far away from her. She could bear anything if she could only feel that father wasn't very far away from her, just beyond that wavering curtain. Douglas Starr held her until she fell asleep. And then in spite of his weakness, he managed to lay her down in her little bed. She will love deeply, he whispered to himself, and then went on to bed. Douglas Starr lived two weeks more. Later on, when the pain had gone out of her recollection, Emily thought that those two weeks were the most precious of her memories. They were beautiful. Beautiful and not sad. When the far off whistle of the afternoon train blew beyond the hills, Emily's heart began to beat. She clasped her hands and lifted her face. Please help me, Father's God, not Ellen's God. Help me to be brave and not cry before the Murrays. Later that night, after the funeral, she went back up to her bed. She thought she would throw herself on her bed and cry. But then her eyes fell on the old yellow account book on her little table. A minute later, she was curled up on her bed, Turk fashion, writing eagerly in the old book with her little stubby lead pencil. As her fingers flew over the faded lines, her cheeks flushed and her eyes shone. She forgot the Murrays, although she was writing about them. Sweet Aunt Laura, nice cousin Jimmy, grim old Uncle Wallace, and moon-faced Uncle Oliver, stately Aunt Elizabeth, and detestable Aunt Ruth. For an hour she wrote steadily by the wretched light of her smoky little lamp, never pausing, save now and then, to gaze out of the window into the dim beauty of the misty night. While she hunted through her consciousness for a certain word she wanted, when she found it, she gave a happy sigh and continued to write. She only felt tired and rather happy. It had been fun finding the words to describe how she had felt that day. And with that, she got into bed. She did not say goodbye to the wind woman for she knew the wind woman would be at new moon. But she did say goodbye to the little window and the green hill she had loved and to her fairy haunted barrens and to little Emily in the glass. There might be another Emily in the glass at new moon, but she wouldn't be the same one. And she unpinned from the wall and stowed away in her pocket the picture of the ball dress she had cut from a fashion sheet. 
It was such a wonderful dress, all white lace and wreaths of rosebuds with a long, long train of lace flounces that must reach clear across a room. Emily had pictured herself a thousand times wearing that dress, sweeping a queen of beauty across a ballroom floor. Downstairs, they were all waiting for her. Then they were off in the double-seated buggy with its fringed canopy, always affected by the Murrays of New Moon Emily had never driven in anything so splendid before. She had never had many drives. Cousin Jimmy and Aunt Elizabeth sat in front, the latter very imposing in black lace bonnet and mantle. Aunt Laura and Emily occupied the seat behind, with saucy sail between them in a basket, shrieking piteously. Emily glanced back as they drove up the grassy lane and thought the little old brown house in the hollow had a broken-hearted look. She longed to run back and comfort it. In spite of her resolution, the tears came to her eyes. But Aunt Laura put a kid-cloved hand across Sal's basket and caught Emily's in a close, understanding squeeze. Oh, I just love you, Aunt Laura, whispered Emily. And Aunt Laura's eyes were very, very blue and deep and kind. Eventually they stopped in Charlottetown for dinner and afterwards Emily asked Cousin Jimmy, do you never have ice cream at New Moon? Cousin Jimmy shook his head. Your Aunt Elizabeth doesn't like newfangled things. New Moon is a pretty good place after all. You'll like it someday. Are there any fairies there? Asked Emily wistfully. Oh, the woods are full of them, said Cousin Jimmy, and so are the columbines in the old orchard. We grow columbines there, just for the fairies. Really, truly fairies, she questioned. Why, you know, if a fairy was really truly, it wouldn't be a fairy. Emily looked about her on her new environment and found it good. It was a rosy sunset that flooded the long, sandy sea coast with color she saw a big house peering whitely through a veil of tall old trees. No mushroom growth of yesterday's birches, but trees that had loved and been loved by three generations. A glimpse of silver water glistening through the dark spruces. That was the Blair water itself. She knew and a tall golden white church spire shooting up above the maple woods in the valley below. But it was none of these that brought her the flash. That came with the sudden glimpse of the dear, friendly little dormer window peeping through the vines on the roof. And right over it, the opalescent sky, a real new moon, golden and slender. Emily was tingling all over with it as Cousin Jimmy lifted her from the buggy and carried her into the kitchen. Emily sat on a long wooden bench that was satin smooth with age and scrubbing, and she watched Aunt Elizabeth lighting candles here and there in great shining brass candlesticks on the shelf between the windows, on the high dresser where the row of blue and white plates began to wink her a friendly welcome, on the long table in the corner, and as she lighted them, elfish rabbit candles flashed up amid the trees outside the windows. 
Emily had never seen a kitchen like this before. It had dark wooden walls and low ceiling with black rafters crossing it. The sanded floor was spotlessly white. Cold, said Aunt Laura kindly. These June evenings are chilly yet. Come into the sitting room. Jimmy has kindled a fire in the stove there. Emily went into the sitting room. It was much more cheerful than the kitchen. The table had a bright crimson cloth. The walls were hung with pretty diamond patterned paper. Emily had never seen such curtains before. But best of all were the friendly gleams and flickers from the jolly hardwood fire and the open stove that mellowed the ghostly candlelight with something warm and rosy golden. Emily toasted her toes before it and felt revived interest in her surroundings. What lovely little leaded glass doors closed the china closets on either side of the high, black, polished mantel. What mysteries might lurk behind the chintz-lined glass doors of the bookcase? Books were Emily's friends whenever she found them. She flew over to the bookcase and opened the door. But before she could see more than the backs of all those volumes, Aunt Elizabeth came in with a mug of milk and a plate with two little oatmeal cakes. Here's your supper, Emily. We're all so tired that we're just having a lunch. Eat it and then we'll go to bed. Emily drank the milk and ate the oat cakes, still gazing about her. How pretty was the garland of roses wallpaper. She wondered if she could see it in the air And so she tried. She could. There it hung, a yard from her eyes, a little fairy pattern suspended in midair like a screen. Emily had discovered that she possessed this odd knack when she was six. By a certain movement of the muscles of her eyes, which she could never describe, she could produce a tiny replica of the wallpaper in the air before her. She could hold it there and look at it as long as she liked. She could shift it back and forth to any distance she chose, making it larger or smaller as it went farther away or came nearer. It was one of her secret joys when she went into a new room anywhere to see the paper in the air. And this new moon paper made the prettiest fairy paper she had ever seen. And then she heard the wind woman at the window. She heard the little low whispering murmur of the June night breeze, cooing, friendly, lovesome. Oh, you're out there, are you dearest one? She whispered, stretching out her arms, Oh, I'm so glad to hear you. You are such company, wind woman. I'm not lonesome anymore. And the flash came. I was afraid it might never come at new moon. Far and wide she wandered in enchanted reverie until she coasted the shore of dreams and fell soundly asleep on the fat, hard pillow while the wind woman sang softly and luringly in the vines that clustered over new moon. The first Saturday and Sunday at new moon always stood out in Emily's memory as a very wonderful time. So crowded was it with new and generally delightful impressions. 
If it be true that we count time by heart throbs, Emily lived two years in it instead of two days. Everything was fascinating from the moment she came down the long, polished staircase into the square hall that was filled with a soft, rosy light coming through the red glass panes of the front door. Emily gazed through the panes delightedly. What a strange, fascinating red world she beheld with a weird red sky that looked, she thought, as if it belonged to the Day of Judgment. There was a certain charm about the old house which Emily felt keenly and responded to, although she was too young to understand it. It was a house which aforetime had had vivid brides and mothers and wives, and the atmosphere of their loves and lives still hung around it, not yet banished by the old maidishness of the regime of Elizabeth and Laura. Why, I'm going to love New Moon, thought Emily, quite amazed at the idea. Aunt Laura was setting the breakfast table in the kitchen, which seemed quite bright and jolly in the glow of morning sunshine. Delicious smells were coming from the cookhouse, which was a little slant-roofed building at the corner where the big cooking stove was placed in summer. It was thickly overgrown with hop vines, as most of the new moon buildings were. To the right was the new orchard, very wonderful now in blossom, and had grain growing in the wide spaces between the straight rows of trees that all looked alike. But on the other side of the barn lane, just behind the well, was the old orchard where Cousin Jimmy said the columbines grew, and which seemed to be a delightful place, where trees had come up at their own sweet will and grown into individual shapes and sizes, where blue-eyed ivy twined about their roots and wild briar roses rioted over the gray paling fence. Straight ahead, closing the vista behind the orchards, was a little slope covered with huge white birches, among which were the big new moon barns. And beyond the new orchard, a little lovable red road looped lightly up and up over a hill until it seemed to touch the vivid blue of the sky. Cousin Jimmy came down from the barns carrying brimming pails of milk and Emily ran with him to the dairy behind the cookhouse. Such a delightful spot she had never seen or imagined. It was a snow white little building in a clump of tall balm of Gilead's its gray roof was dotted over with cushions of moss, like fat green velvet mice. After breakfast, Aunt Elizabeth informed Emily that henceforth it would be one of her duties to drive the cows to pasture every morning. Jimmy has no hired man just now, and it will save him a few minutes. And don't be afraid, said Aunt Laura. The cows know the way so well, they'll go themselves. You have only to follow and shut the gates. I'm not afraid, said Emily, but she was. She knew nothing about cows. Still, she was determined that the Murrays should not suspect a star was scared. So her heart beating like a trip hammer, she sallied valiantly forth and found what Aunt Laura had said was true. Cows were not such ferocious animals after all. 
They went gravely on ahead, and she had only to follow through the old orchard, along a twisted ferny path where the wind woman was purring and peeping around the maple clumps. Emily loitered by the pasture gate until her eager eyes had taken in all the geography of the landscape. The old pasture ran before her in a succession of little green bosoms right down to the famous Blair Water. An almost perfectly round pond with grassy, sloping, treeless margins. Beyond it was the Blair Water Valley, filled with homesteads, and further out, the great sweep of the white-capped gulf. It seemed to Emily's eyes a charming land of green shadows and blue waters. Off to the right, on the crest of a steep little hill, covered with young birches and firs, was a house that puzzled and intrigued Emily. It was gray and weather-worn, but it didn't look old. It had never been finished. The roof was shingled, but the sides were not, and the windows were boarded over. Why had it never been finished? And it was meant to be such a pretty little house, a house you could love, a house where there would be nice chairs and cozy fires and bookcases and unexpected corners. Then and there she named it the Disappointed House, and many an hour thereafter did she spend finishing that house, furnishing it as it should be furnished, and inventing the proper people and animals to live in it. She felt that before she went back, she must slip along the pasture fence and explore a certain path, which she saw entering the grove of spruce and maple further down. She did and found that it led straight into fairyland, along the bank of a wide, lovely brook, a wild, dear little path with lady ferns beckoning and blowing along it, the shyest of elfin June bells under the firs, and little whims of loveliness at every curve. She breathed in the tang of fir balsam and saw the shimmer of gossamers high up in the boughs and everywhere the frolic of elfin lights and shadows. Here and there, the young maple branches interlaced as if to make a screen for dryad faces. Emily knew all about dryads, thanks to her father. This is one of the places where dreams grow, said Emily happily. Emily loved the beautiful land around her, and in spite of the ache for her father and the house in the hollow, which persisted all the time, and hurt her so much at night that her pillow was wet with secret tears. She was beginning to be a little glad again in sunset and bird song and early white stars. In moonlit nights and singing winds, she knew life was going to be wonderful here, wonderful and interesting. And now she had made up her mind that she would find the lost diamond. She was insensibly becoming happy again. Already she felt as if she belonged to this old cradle of her family. She thought a great deal about the old Murrays. She liked to picture them revisiting the glimpses of new moon great-grandmother rubbing up her candlesticks and making cheeses, 
Great Aunt Miriam stealing about looking for her lost treasure. Homesick Great Aunt Elizabeth stalking about in her bonnet. Captain George, the dashing bronzed sea captain, coming home with the spotted shells of the Indies. Stephen, the beloved of all, smiling from its windows. Her own mother, dreaming of father. They all seemed as real to her as if she had known them in life. She still had terrible hours when she was overwhelmed by grief for her father and when all the splendors of new moon could not stifle the longing for the shabby little house in the hollow where they had loved each other so. Then Emily fled to some secret corner and cried her heart out, emerging with red eyes. She knew that Aunt Laura and Cousin Jimmy loved her, and she had saucy Sal and Rhoda, fields creamy with clover, soft, dark trees against amber skies, and the madcap music, the wind woman, made in the firs behind the barns when she blew straight up from the gulf. Her days became vivid and interesting, full of little pleasures and delights, like tiny opening, golden buds on the tree of life. If she could only have had her old yellow account book or some equivalent, she could have been fully content. She missed it next to her father. It did not seem possible to get any substitute. As Cousin Jimmy had said, writing paper of any kind was scarce at New Moon. Letters were seldom written, and when they were, one sheet of paper sufficed. But there is a destiny which shapes the ends of young misses who are born with the itch for writing, tingling in their baby fingertips. And in the fullness of time, this destiny gave to Emily the desire of her heart. Thereafter, few evenings passed on which Emily did not steal up to the garret and write a letter long or short, to her father. The bitterness died out of her grief. Writing to him seemed to bring him so near, and she told him everything with a certain honesty of confession. Everything went down on the letter bills of a government which had not been so economical of paper as it afterwards became. There was fully half a yard of paper in each bill, and Emily wrote a small hand and made the most of every inch of those letter bills. I like New Moon. It's so stately and splendid here, she told her father. I can't help feeling proud of it all. I'm afraid I have too much pride, and so I ask God every night to take most of it away, but not quite all. It is very easy to get a reputation for pride in Blair Water School. If you walk straight and hold your head up, you are a proud one. Rhoda is proud too, because her father ought to be King of England. I wonder how Queen Victoria would feel if she knew that. It's very wonderful to have a friend. And I know Rhoda would be a princess if everyone had their rights. I love Rhoda with all my heart. She is sweet and kind. I didn't tell Rhoda about the Wind Woman because I suppose that really is a kind of lie though she seems so real to me. I hear her now, singing up on the roof around the big chimneys. 
I have no Emily in the glass here. The looking glasses are all too high up in the rooms I've been in. I wrote a biography of Saucy Sail today and a description of the road in Lofty John's Bush. I'll pin them to this letter so you can read them too. Good night, my beloved father, your most obedient, humble servant, Emily B. Starr. P.S. I think Aunt Laura loves me. I like to be loved, Father dear. The next day, Emily wrote another long letter. Dear Father, I wrote a very long poem on a letter bill today. It's called The Monarch of the Forest. The monarch is the big birch in Lofty John's bush. I love that bush so much it hurts. Do you understand that kind of hurting? Ilsa likes it too and we play there most of the time when we're not in the tansy patch. We have three paths in it. We call them the Today Road, the Yesterday Road, and the Tomorrow Road. The Today Road is by the brook, and we call it that because it is lovely now. The Yesterday Road is out in the stumps where Lofty John cut down some trees, and we call it that because it used to be lovely. The Tomorrow Road is just a tiny path in the maple clearing, and we call it that because it's going to be lovely someday when the maples grow bigger. But oh, Father dear, I haven't forgotten the dear old trees down at home. I always think of them after I go to bed, but I'm happy here. It isn't wrong to be happy, is it, Father? Aunt Elizabeth says I got over being homesick very quick, but I am often homesick inside. On rainy days, we play at Ilsa's. We can slide down the banisters and do what we like. Nobody cares, only when the doctor is home. We do have to be quiet then because he can't bear any noise in the house, except what he makes himself. The roof is flat and we can get out on it through a door in the garret ceiling. It's exciting to be up on the roof of a house. We had a yelling contest there the other night to see who could yell the loudest. To my surprise, I found I could. You never can tell what you can do till you try. But too many people heard us, and Aunt Elizabeth was very angry. She asked me what made me do such a thing. That's an awkward question, because often I can't tell what makes me do things. Sometimes I do them just to find out what I feel like doing them. And sometimes I do them because I want to have some exciting things to tell my grandchildren. One evening when people were here, Aunt Laura said to me quite kindly, What are you thinking so earnestly about, Emily? And I said, I'm picking names for my children. I mean to have ten. And after the company had gone, Aunt Elizabeth said to Aunt Laura, I think it will be better in the future, Laura, if you do not ask that child what she's thinking of. If Laura doesn't, I shall be sorry, because when I have an interesting thought, I like to tell it. School begins next week. Ilsa is going to ask Miss Bronwell if I can sit with her. Aunt Laura says the right way to end a letter to a dear friend is yours affectionately. So, I am yours very affectionately, Emily Bird Starr. Upon writing this letter to her father, Emily was worn out. She fell asleep as soon as she was in bed 
but an hour later she awakened. So the blind was still up, and Emily saw a dear, friendly star winking down at her. Far away, the sea moaned alluringly. Oh, it was nice just to be alone and to be alive. Life tasted good to Emily again. Tasted like more, as Cousin Jimmy said. Father, I just thought of something nice. When I grow up and write a great novel and make lots of money, I will buy the disappointed house and finish it, and then it won't be disappointed anymore. Cousin Jimmy says there'll be a snowstorm tonight. I'm glad. I like to hear a storm at night. It's so cozy to snuggle down among the blankets and feel that it can't get at you. I remember how safe I felt when you held me on your knee and snuggled me close. I miss you, Father. It's lovely to write to you, but I wish you could answer me. Oh, and I wanted you to know that I don't feel like a stranger among the Murrays anymore. One evening, Aunt Laura and I stood out on the porch she put her arm around me and said, Your mother and I used to stand like this long ago, Emily, to watch the Christmas guests when they went away. The snow creaked and the bells rang back through the trees and the frost on the pig house roof sparkled in the moonlight and it was all so lovely. The bells and the frost and the big shining white night. And then the flash came, and that was best of all. And that's the end of part one. And I wish you sweet dreams and good night.